So it's my pleasure to introduce you the next uh, speaker in this session is Dr. Lig Buet uh, from the University of Lille. Um, Dr. Buet, he did his PhD at the Mount Sinai Me Medical Center and uh, he's now director of a research center at the University of Lille Hospital. Um, he has a long-standing inter long interest in uh, tau biology or tau aggregation and uh, cellular functions, um, as well as uh, in the development of cellular and animal models of disease. And uh, he's going to talk about tau experimental models and therapeutic uh, strategies. So Dr. Bue, um, thank you for being here and welcome to Alicante, please. Uh, buenos dias. That's the only word I can say in Spanish. So, <laughs> uh, first, I, I would like to, to thank the organizer and uh, especially uh, Jesus and Miguel uh, for letting me uh, giving you a, a few insight about Tao. And as Eckhart told you yesterday, I think it's very difficult to talk about Tao in Spain because I mean. Uh, you have Tao specialists. In fact, for a long time, Tao was almost only studied in Europe <laughs> before Tao mutation and so on. So, on. so it's a kind of a European tradition to, to work on, on Tao. So I'm coming from a, a city in the north of France. It looks like a Spanish city, but it, it's really a, a, a French city, but it was a Spanish part somewhere in history. <laughs> so. Finally, we are not uh, so so far. Um, I change a little my talk uh, because, of course, we try to overlap uh, the different talks on Tao. So I must apologize because I think I have too many slides. So I, I, I will have to speed up on some of them. So the idea is really to. Oops, just trying to see if it works, yes. To present my, my, my team first, I mean, I have a big team, it's about uh, 40 to 50 people working in my lab, um, and they are all working on tau, either on tau genomics, tau splicing, tau protein, tau pathology, and we are part of a national uh, consortium on Alzheimer's disease with people involved in genetics like uh, Philippe Amouyel or on amyloid like Frédéric Scheckler and also clinician neurologists like Florence Pasquier and we have many collaboration in both uh, France, Europe and so on, so not, not all of them uh, are, are, are here. So on today's talk I will mostly focus on tau biology and mostly on non-microtubule tau functions. A few words on tau pathology, but not really related to Alzheimer's disease, but mostly related to other neurodegenerative disorders with aggregation of these tau proteins. And then I will finish on a few words on tau experimental models and therapeutic strategy we can have on the tau, and especially a few words on tau secretion and tau spreading if I have enough time. <laughs> okay, as um, many people told you yesterday, uh, we have uh, tau aggregation in Alzheimer's disease, and you, you can see here that you have six tau isoforms in the human brains, and the, the six tau isoforms aggregate into filament to form neurofibrillary degeneration. This neurofibrillary degeneration start in the hippocampal formation, then will go to the temporal lobe, then to polymodal association area, unimodal association area, and then you will have the full entire cerebral cortex with uh, tau pathology and neurofibrillary degeneration. A few words on tau, you know that tau is a microtubule associated protein, so I'm not going to develop that, that it's under the regulation of phosphorylation, so you have a balance between kinases and phosphatases. But you, you know also that tau is not only linked to uh, microtubule regulation, it has also other functions, and I will focus on a few of them where we are interested in the lab. 
Uh, yesterday we, we had a question about tau in the nucleus, so I say maybe that can be interesting to talk about tau in the nucleus. We found that tau binds to DNA and is involved in DNA protection. It's also demonstrated by NMR spectroscopy showing interaction of tau with DNA, but tau not only binds to DNA but also to any nucleic acid, so, and it may protect this uh, nucleic acid for from oxidative stress, for instance. So you, you can imagine that in neurodegenerative disorders, of course, you have a huge amount of oxidative stress, and without tau, you will have damage to nucleic acid. So that's what we have shown in these uh, uh, articles. What we have shown also, we and others, is that tau is also involved in chromatin remodeling. And especially, we have shown that loss of tau affects the structure of the transcription and repair of non all centromatic heterochromatin. So it means that tau is a key player also in the nucleus, having some role in the chromatin, transcription effects, and also protection. If you think about tau, we did some transcriptomic studies in uh, tau knockout mice, for instance, and we show that there is a huge variation in the expression in the expression of genes involved in DNA repair, for instance. A few words on tau and metabolisms. So for the lab, there is a joke about me saying I have a tau loss of function. Why? Um, because when you look at tau knockout mice, in fact, they are obese. And if you look at, yeah. <laughs> And if you look at a uh, model over expressing tau, they are skinny. So it means that there is a balance between the, a loss of function where you get obese uh, mice and an over expression of tau where you get skinny mice. And recently we show that in fact tau was involved in the, uh, sig uh, the insulin signaling in neuron. And so we think that tau is also involved in this transduction signal. So you can imagine, for instance, that yesterday we, we heard about diabetes is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, but you can also imagine that a loss of function may trigger diabetes. So maybe a loss fun of, function of tau function may be uh, related to, may be instrumental in diabetes. If you look also to, to this tau loss of function, there is also a huge uh, debate about decreasing tau because this is better for amyloid toxicity. If you decrease tau, you also change synaptic plasticity. So it means also that tau is involved in, uh, in synaptic function. Finally, a few words on uh, extracellular tau. Extracellular tau is used for if some of you are neurologists or medical biologists, it's used for Alzheimer's disease diagnosis because you have an, an increase in tau concentration in CSF, and we know that there are extracellular tau. At the beginning, we thought it was related to uh, neuronal death, and you get a release of tau, but in fact, more and more people think that there is a normal secretion of tau by neurons. We don't know exactly how it works. Uh, it's not un unusual if you think about uh, FGF2 or interleukin 1 beta, you think, okay, that's secreted protein. But they are like tau, they are cytosolic secreted protein. So it means they are not going through the reticulum, the Golgi, and get secreted. There are, for instance, for interleukin 1 beta, there is cleavage in the carboxyterminal part of the protein, which allow the secretion. For FGF2, there is a low oligomerization of the protein, which allow for the secretion. So you see, it's different cell biology mechanisms that right now we don't understand. And that's why I want to emphasize that research, basic research, is very important if you're looking for therapeutic strategies, because you need to know this basic science. So a few words on this extracellular tau. First, 
there was a, a number of reports in the past showing that tau was extracellular, it was toxic. Uh, but most of, it, of this report, especially those of Rezus, I mean, was unknown in the literature, I think, that because everybody came out with this, for instance, this article by Amy Puller showing that there is secretion of tau, but it was known that tau was secreted and was also binding to uh, some receptor, for instance, and have some interference with uh, biology. So how can tau is secreted? It can be, as I told you, a normal secretion as a free forms, but it can be also in extracellular vesicles. Maybe you have heard about exosome, uh, microparticles, so you can find tau within these vesicles. So I'm not going to go into detail here, but I will say a few words later on. Now let's move to tau pathology, and as I told you, of course, tau aggregate in Alzheimer's disease, but it also aggregate in other neurodegenerative disorders. So in Alzheimer's disease, you get the aggregation of a six tau isoform present in the brain, but in other tauopathies, tauopathies meaning these neurodegenerative disorders with tau aggregation, like Alzheimer's disease, Pick's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, corticobasal degeneration, frontal temporal lobe degeneration, even some neuromuscular disorders, I mean, there's a number of, you see tau aggregation here, for instance, in progressive supranuclear palsy, in corticobasal degeneration, in argyrophilic grand disease, and here in frontotemporal dementia in PIX disease. And each time you can see that these aggregates are different. So we looked at the molecular level, what was going on, and in Alzheimer's disease, you have the six tau isoform which aggregate into filament. But now if you look in progressive supranuclear palsy, for instance, you have only the three tau isoform with four microtubule binding domain. And in pig's disease, you have the three isoform with three microtubule binding domains. And here it's an example of myotonic dystrophy. In this case, you have only the aggregation of one isoform. So of course that's very puzzling. And we have to understand what's going on with this tau aggregation. So we, are look, we have looked at the etiology of these uh, tauopathies. And in tauopathies, you are going to have, for instance, dementia pugilistica, chronic, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathies or trauma brain injury. We're talking a lot about that, like rugby player, uh, American football player, uh, hockey player, and of course, boxer. And when you have a trauma like that, I mean, you have tau aggregation. If you look at children, for instance, with autistic children with self-injury behavior, maybe you, you, you see this, uh, these kids knocking their head on the wall, they develop neurofibrillary degeneration also. There is also infec uh, infectious, uh, sorry, we're in Spain, the Spanish flu, with <laughs> postencephalitic Parkinsonism, and also missiles can lead also to uh, SSPE and of course uh, tau aggregation. Met metabolic disorder like Niemann Pick's disease type C and also toxin like on the Guam Island, the Ca French Caribbeans or even in some uh, uh, cities where huge uh, industri industrial uh, waste. There is also some genetic effects, and I will emphasize a little on these genetic effects. Just to illustrate uh, this diversity in etiology, I took the example of progressive supranuclear palsy because for any clinician, I mean, progressive supranuclear palsy is pretty clear. Uh, there is sometimes a mix with corticobasal degeneration, uh, but it's a defined clinical entity. If you look at the neuropathology, it's not always true. And if you look at the time course of a disease, it's also complicated. I'm talking about that because it's a typical tauopathy. And some big pharma think that PSP can be a, a good model to test drugs for Alzheimer's disease because it's a orphan disease, so it costs less money, 
to go in this kind of clinical trial and to go for Alzheimer's disease. But the process is very different. We will see that in Alzheimer's disease, neurofibrillary degeneration lasts for at least 20 years. So it means that you have a therapeutic window, which is pretty important. In PHP, it's a very, very quick disease, which leads to death very rapidly. So it's a big difference, and we see that the etiologies also are different. So if I'm taking the example of uh, P classical PSP, I mean, it's different from the ALS, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinsonism, dementia complex of Guam, uh, but it's very similar to the PSP we, which encountered in uh, French Caribbeans. And in this case, we think that it's related to toxin uh, present in fruits, and these toxins are, in fact, mitochondrial complex one inhibitors. So there's a number of articles showing the link between these mitochondrial complex inhibitors and the appearance of uh, tau pathology. Um, in the north of France, we linked also PSP to industrial waste, and especially when uh, you have uh, I increase in arsenic concentration, you will find an increased number of uh, PSP uh, patients. I'm sorry, I cannot go into detail for everything. The other part of P PSP is related to genetic factors. So I'm coming back to, uh, to the, the, the tau gene MAPT, and which is located on the chromosome 17, and by alternative splicing, you raise the six tau isoforms. So the first thing I identified in PSP was, in fact, that there was some genetic linkage with the H1, H2 haplotype, meaning that your gene is one way or the other way. Clearly, that's pretty simple. So there is an association signal in the uh, tau genes for PSP and also for corticobasal degeneration. It's still pretty controversial. Uh, we show also that there is uh, epigenomic changes. For instance, if you study uh, the human brain in, in frontal cortex where you have tau pathology or in occipital cortex where you don't have any pathology, you will see a decrease in methylation in PSP uh, patient on the promoter of the tau gene. So there was a, a, a replication study showing you get this decrease in, in methylation and you have an increase specifically in the expression of four repeat tau isoform in the frontal cortex, but not in the occipital cortex where you don't have any pathology. So epigenomics may be related to toxin or other stuff are also related to uh, the, tau uh, the tau pathology. As I told you, there is also an increase in four repeat tau isoform, meaning that you get four microtubule binding domain, as explained yesterday by uh, Heckart. And you have this typical profile with a, a, a tau, upper tau doublet. And it means that you have more four repeat tau isoforms than three repeat tau isoforms. So we look also if the splicing was involved in uh, the story, and regarding always epigenomics, we were able to show that there is some microRNA decrease in PSP, which modulates splicing factors, which may explain the incorporation of this additional sequence in transcript and increase in four repeat tau isoforms. So, this idea of splicing, if you get aggregation of four repeat tau isoform, three repeat tau isoform, the six tau isoform, or only one without any additional sequence, is of course very interesting. It's very interesting because it may explain the differential aggregation of this tau isoform. And we know that there are some mutations on the tau gene yesterday. Uh, I can't talk about that, and these mutations are mostly located in the microtubule binding region and may explain a, a differential splicing, either increase in free repeat compared to four repeat or increase in four repeat compared to free repeat. So these mutations are very useful 
to understand that factors that may lead to uh, neurodegeneration. So we, we study a lot this mutation, not always involved in splicing, but there is a huge heterogeneity. I took two mutations, the one within the microtubule binding domains, and I mean the, the, the lady who, who were the, the founder mutation died at 60 years old, so it's pretty young, and the two sons have uh, onset of the disease at 50. On another mutation, it's even worse, because the teenager was seven, 17 years old, and the father did not show any uh, symptoms, and he had the mutation. So you see also that there is huge differences in the uh, onset of the disease for the same mutation within the same family. So it's very complicated, because when you have a young teenager depressed, uh, not interested by anything, you're not thinking about neurodegenerative disorders. So you don't see a neurologist, you see a psychologist. But she started at 17, she died at 24. So you see, it's, we have to be very cautious now in uh, following this patient. So the idea is that when you change any uh, tau isoforms within the neurons, it may lead to aggregation. So is it related really to splicing, or is it related to subnormal population? In fact, it's both. So it may be more complicated than what we thought. Anyway, splicing is important, and uh, for that we, we use a disease model, which is myotonic dystrophy. I don't know if you know myotonic dystrophy. It's like Huntington's disease or spinocerebellar ataxia. Uh, you have uh, a poly-CUG track increase. I say CUG because, I mean, it's never translated into protein. So it means that we have transcriptional CUG and CUG tracks, and the CUG tracks stay at the mRNA level and are able to sequester any splicing factors. So the idea is that if you get splicing modification, you will have disease. And myotonic dystrophy is wonderful, in a way, for studying splicing, because this patient has diabetes, but it's related to a defect in splicing in the insulin receptor. They have uh, myotonia. It's related to defects in channel chloride, in splicing in channel chloride. They have heart problem. It's related to splicing in troponin T gene. And they have muscle weakness, and we don't know exactly which of the gen gene is responsible for uh, this muscle weakness, but all of these genes have splicing problems. And finally, we have cognitive deficits, and there are some splicing I show you in tau, but also in other genes like uh, uh, NMDA receptor or APP. So to make a story short, I mean, really we have shown that there is a link between the splicing of tau and uh, the cognitive defect, and that in fact it's related to a family of splicing factors called muscle blind. And recently we shown that muscle blind is really the key uh, family of proteins involved in myotonic dystrophy for aberrant splicing in most of these uh, genes. Okay, coming back to tau now. A few things on uh, background of, on tau models, I mean now we know we have six tau isoforms in the brain that they aggregate and lead to no fibrolite degeneration. Yesterday, uh, Eckhart showed you this kind of picture saying that uh, it's one of the hypotheses that if you have hyperphosphorylated tau, you get depolymerization of the microtubule and axonal damage. I mean, for most of us, I mean, we are not sure it's really like that, why? Because you don't have a huge loss of white matter in Alzheimer's patient, for instance. So meaning you, your axonal loss, maybe, yeah, 
axonal defects, but not really uh, axonal degeneration. The other thing I was telling you is that, in fact, it takes a long, long time for a known to die with no fibrillary degeneration. Globally, I mean, we have like a, a 15 to 20 years uh, time before to go from appearance of tower aggregates until ghost tangles, meaning really uh, a ghost of aggregated tau. So how to study this neurofibrillary degeneration? Yesterday we told you that if you try to overexpress tau, you don't have any aggregation. So the best way is to use this mutation I told you about and uh, Hecat told you. There is some pro-aggregating mutation, but there is also other mutation. You can use them in worm. Yesterday we have a quick <laughs> view on worm. <laughs> and how uh, you have degradation. You can use that in fly, in fish, in rodents, and even in non-human primates. I will focus, of course, on rodents here. Uh, the other thing we have to say is that uh, we have really a therapeutic window. Yesterday, I mean, it was a, a, a clear demonstration. When you switch up the transgene of, for tau, pathological tau, you rescue, really, the phenotype. There is a number of papers like that. There is also paper showing that when you start neurofibrillary degeneration, I mean, if your tangles is within neural network, your neural network is still functional. So in the lab, we use a specific model with two mutations. Why two? Because, you know, we're French. We always think that two is better than one. Honestly, I'm not, I'm not sure that uh, it did anything uh, different than one, but uh, when it's done, it's done. Anyway, and we were lucky enough to have expression of this tau transgene only in the uh, subiculum and the CA1 layer of the hippocampus. So it's really the region which is affected in Alzheimer's disease. So you have aggregation, and we have a nice correlation between the appearance of neurofibrillary degeneration and a cognitive task, like here, a cognitive deficit in the Morris water maze. I'm not going into detail, you have to trust me on that. Uh, we have also uh, some synaptic defects, either by LTD and what we, we call the B, BDNF synaptic uh, facilitation, so BDNF LTP. We don't have anything in classical LTP. So there are some uh, synaptic defects in these mice. Can we use this kind of tau transgenic mice to study modulating factors and to see how our daily life, or can we have therapeutic strategies using these models? So we have to come back to Alzheimer's disease and epidemiology. So we know with a genome-wide association study a number of genes involved for the risk of Alzheimer's. But we have also another, a number of environmental factors banked uh, yesterday or the day before. No, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time last for uh, very quick in, uh, in Alicante. Um, Banks show that you have multimodal studies where you're going to do physical exercise, you're going to change uh, your diet, you're going to change many things, and you see improvement on uh, cognition. So we say, okay, can we look at environmental factor? We looked at so also at genes, but I'm not going to focus on that, maybe a few things. Uh, and see if we can modulate the daily life or, of our tau transgenic mice. Uh, if I'm talking about daily life, it's always in reflect also to what's going on from GWAS. And in GWAS, we have seen that cholesterol pathway is very important. The immune response is very important. Endocytosis, I mean, I, I talk about tau secretion or endocytosis of APP and amyloid formation, so it's pretty evident, and cytoskeleton also. And you see, of, of course, APP and tau. Anyway, but we get interested in cholesterol immune response and endocytosis a little, but uh, regarding cholesterol and immune response, it, it's interesting because that's something we can modulate. So 
which factors influence Alzheimer's disease risk? Environmental factors. It can be physical exercise or coffee. We're just finishing the coffee break, so. Um, we had a prize on resveratrol, so resveratrol is part of red wine, okay? Uh, an aesthetic agent and other slap stuff, I, I will not develop on that. What we have looked is that high fat diet, so obesity, will increase tau pathology. If you're doing physical exercise, you're, you're going to decrease tau pathology. Now, if you get anesthesia, and that's pretty terrible because anesthesia, you get like this post uh, operative cognitive decline, and most of the patients are fine after a couple of hours. But think about elderly people. They have usually repetitive anesthesia. So when we looked at anesthesia, you can see that it, there is a reversal of tau modification leading to aggregation. But if you do reversal, uh, repetitive uh, anesthesia, you don't have this reversal anymore. So it means that it's not anesthesia as a single anesthesia, which is a risk factor. It's the repetition of anesthesia, which is a risk factor for cognitive defects in mice. No, but I mean, we have to be careful. I mean, you know, I can finish like that and say, okay, and then what happened in human? We, I mean, who want to get a hip replacement without anesthesia? Nobody. <laughs> okay, if you look at physical exercise, for in, in instance, we looked at these omics approaches. So you can do transcriptomics, proteomics, any omics you want. You can see things move, not a, not a lot. If you look at cholesterol pathway, the only thing which really moved are CYP46 and a little NPC1 and NPC2, but I'm not going to talk about that. CYP46 is a, an enzyme involved in cholesterol esterification. And esterification of cholesterol is very important because it's how it's getting to your brain or outside of the brain. So if you have esterified cholesterol, it will be very important. If now you use gene therapy approach and you inject CYP46 in our mice, you can rescue everything in our mice. Behavior, synaptic plasticity, only by, by modulating cholesterol. Even no inflammation is decreasing following that. Coming back to that, okay, so we have a link to cholesterol. If you do the same thing with this enzyme in an amyloid model, you get the same data. So meaning that cholesterol uh, brain homeostasis is very important. We looked also at neuroinflammation because everybody say, okay, in Alzheimer's disease, we have two brain lesions, amyloid deposits and neurofibrillary tangles. But everybody say also, and we have a huge neuroinflammation. Yeah, that's not multiple sclerosis, so yeah, you have inflammation, it means you have gliosis. So what can we do with that? We were interested to, that, to, to, to this inflammation because in fact, uh, when we did the first transcriptomic studies in our mice, uh, the first family of gene coming out was related to inflammation and the immune system. So we say, okay, there is something really important here. And we just finalized these two studies showing that in fact, yes, there is a huge increase in a family of genes involved in inflammation. We have microglial activation, chemokine production. We know that chemokine, especially the one we study, which is a CCL3, interfere with synaptic plasticity and may explain cognitive deficit. And we have also T cell infiltration. And we were puzzled by this T cell infiltration, but we looked at this uh, FTDP17 mutation, you know, the one, the tau mutation uh, in the microtubule binding domains. And this, in this patient, we see also T cell infiltration. So we say, okay, if we get CD8 positive T cells in the brain, 
uh, where it's coming from. And to make a, a story short, we say, okay, we have to remove these T cells. So what we use is an anti-CD3 immunotherapy, something used, for instance, in model of multiple sclerosis. But this time, we did an anti-CD3 immunotherapy for a long time, from three to nine months of, of age. And at the end, we were able to stop T cell infiltration. Of course, we don't have any T cell anymore. And we were able to have improvement in spatial memory, meaning that this stopping the T cell uh, infiltration allow for decreased chemokine production and allows also to restore cognitive uh, behavior. So we have now a link that T cell infiltration is instrumental into the cognitive impairments promoted by tau pathology. So can we modulate this neuroinflammation? Uh, we thought about coffee because coffee is an antioxidant and is, is known also to play on oxidative stress and inflammation. I mean, epidemiological studies say, okay, uh, caffeine is good also for the amyloid. So we say, okay, caffeine may be a good, uh, good stuff. And we were able to show that indeed, uh, caffeine is able to decrease tau pathology, decrease inf inflammation in these uh, mice. So it means that with these mice, you're able to study different environmental factors. Okay, for those who works on caffeine and knows caffeine, you know that caffeine has many uh, targets. And one of the targets is also an antagonist of A2A receptor. So we checked that also, and we show that, in fact, when you uh, breed the mice, the tau transgenic mice, with mice knockout for the A2A A2A receptor, you also rescue the phenotype of, of tau transgenic mice. Meaning that similarly, if you use A2A receptor antagonist, it's good for the tau pathology. You, re you res rescue cognitive deficit and uh, decrease neuroinflammation. I'm not going to the detail, but that's the idea. So with everything now, we have a number of therapeutic approaches. That's number of therapeutic strategies. I think that Bank already talked about most of them. So I'm not going to, to go into detail. Just to say that you can do this kind of work in this tau transgenic mice. You can test uh, active immunization, passive immunization. Here it's an example of active immunization. Here it's the Rush paper showing that uh, you can use also active uh, uh, passive Im I immunization with an antibody against phosphoserine 422. Uh, I should say that the clinical trial stopped in phase one for Marsh. So even if it works in mice, it doesn't mean that it will work in human. Uh, it's very important to, to have this in mind because if you're thinking about tau, if you inject tau, human tau, to no normal mice, you get an autoimmune response. So the idea to have phosphoserine 422 is that this is a kind of pathological epitope which is not present usually in normal mice. So even with this approach, they show that you have risk in human. So on the first conclusion, I will say, or maybe final conclusion, do we have, still have time? Four, three minutes, okay. Uh, I, I should say that tau proteins are more than MAP. Uh, there is a development of different amino models allowing for new therapeutic strategies, but we have to think of how good are these models because it's always overexpression. Talking about tau immunotherapy, okay, you decrease tau levels, but you overexpress tau so much, what does it mean? So people are going now, really, they are knocking models to trying to, to use, to have pathology using the same level of protein. Very quick, I, I will talk about the BRAC strategy, st stages, uh, what we have seen in uh, Alzheimer's disease. It's true also in progressive supranuclear palsy in argyrophilic grand disease. Uh, many people have shown that now that tau is able to be transferred from cell to cell 
and maybe through transsynaptic mechanisms in vitro, and I told you already it can be in free forms, aggregated or not, using um, uh, extracellular vesicles like microparticles, exosome, or tunneling nanotubes. I'm not going to go into details, but we and others have worked a lot on that. There is also in vivo model of this propagation. We develop a rat model on that, showing that you can have a transfer of the tau pathology. And the main problem now is if you have a transfer of a tau pathology, is it a prion-like mechanism? Meaning, when you start to have a kind of aggregation, if you inject this aggregates into mice, you have pathology. But, I mean, it's, you know, yesterday, Eckhart showed you this kind of picture, that uh, monomer of tau can go into protofibrils, but the first step here are very difficult in a thermodynamic way. So, to go faster, or no, to go faster on that, you can add seeds, meaning you can add brain extracts, and speed up the nucleation process, meaning you're going very fast this way, and then for the elongation, it's a quick event. So if you're able to, to lower the, the, the number of, uh, of ta the time to, to aggregate tau, you can increase pathology. I can show you that here, if you inject Alzheimer homogenate or Alzheimer fibers, you are able to develop pathology in mice here very quickly. Why I'm showing that? Because it's very useful to test also antibody. Here we test different antibodies. You can see that this antibody will decrease the seeding of these tau aggregates. So meaning it interferes with tau aggregation. In the, it does not mean that we have uh, tau strains, meaning that we have specific tau aggregates, which may explain only the aggregation, for instance, of four repeat tau isoform, four repeat tau isoforms, but it means that you can speed up the process. So if your tau aggregates are transferred from one cell to another, healthy cells, you can imagine that these healthy cells can develop pathology. So that's why on the social networks you're able to see that you have, uh, I don't know, a kid saying to his mother, why I'm not able to, to visit grandpa? And the mother say, ah, grandpa has Alzheimer's disease, he's contagious. Okay. No, he's not contagious. Okay. So just to thank uh, the sponsor and uh, all my team and sorry for being a little over time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one or two very short questions. Uh, I found very interesting the topic about anesthesia and what happens when it's repeated anesthesia. And if you like, uh, could you comment about the possible relation between anesthesia and hibernation? Because I wonder if a repeated hibernation that takes place in some mammals could also be similar uh, or to, could also to induce some kind of tauopathy or not. Well, anesthesia is complicated because when you're talking about anesthesia, you have to, to talk also about body temperature. So, because when you get anesthesia, uh, usually your body temperature drops down. And if your body temperature drops down, you get hyperphosphorylation of tau, and you get modification in the biology of tau. But if you, you do everything in normothermia, you control tem body temperature, you still have this modification of tau, and you still have deficit. Yesterday, uh, Heckart told you phosphorylation is not a requisite for aggregation. And I think he's right. Now, I will say hyperphosphorylation of tau is linked to cognitive deficit without aggregation. <laughs> because if you get 
hyperphosphorylation and chronic hyperphosphorylation of tau, you get cognitive deficit. Following our work in anesthesiology, a Korean group did the same experiment in knockout mice. They didn't see any change in cognition, meaning that, in fact, the loss of, co I mean, the cognitive deficit is really related to the tau hyperphosphorylation. So, then after there is other things about torpor hibernation, where you have also uh, tau hyperphosphorylation, and, uh, and it can be also, I, I don't know, if you're talking a lot about these tau strands, this signature of tau species, it can be a kind of memory for the cell. If you get uh, aggregation in, uh, in, in bears or in a uh, Syrian hamster for tau, it can be kind of memory of the cells where exactly after the hibernation coming back, we have a, a kind of memory card with this uh, specific pattern of phosphorylation. That's a kind of crazy idea we can have. Uh, look, uh, um, uh, thanks Thank for you. a good talk. Uh, I had a clinical comment on this that we saw that elderly people after anesthesia came into some confusion state often and perhaps even a dementia condition. But if you correct really the, the per operative anesthesia, looking on not getting hypoxia, not getting blood pressure falls, then we really could almost exclude confusion states. So I think oxygenation is a part of it and lowering of blood pressure. So you have to teach your anesthesia nurses how to really supervise elderly patients. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, I, I was talking about body temperature, but we have a number of factors which need to be controlled. But we have also mm -hmm. uh, to be very cautious when we have patients coming for anesthesia or any surgery uh, to know exactly also their, uh, let's say, cognitive status, because it's still a risk factor if there is a huge number of anesthetic, anesthetic uh, intervention, I mean, intervention with anesthesia. I also had a short question. Have you really seen T cells in the human post-mortem Alzheimer brain? I yes. Mean, because I mean, if I look, it's, it's, it's glial cells, it's astrocytes, but T cells is for me Yeah, yeah, we, we, we've checked that with people who used to work on T cells in Parkinson's disease and uh, they looked in uh, frontotemporal dementia with, muta with tau mutations similar to the one we use in our animal model and they are sure they are T cells, so different techniques and uh, so we are sure for T cell infiltration in this case. Honestly, it's not a huge T cell infiltration. It's not multiple sclerosis, huh? so. All right, so I think we have to move on. Thank you very much.